Hey, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and today we are at the Swedish Air Force Museum in Linköping, Sweden. And we're going to take a look at this bad boy here, the J835J Draken. Now this is of course a early-ish Cold War jet fighter in its configuration here. It is also optimized for the air-to-air -air role. And of course, veterans of inside the cockpit will know what's going to happen first. We're going to take a tour of the outside of the aircraft. I'm going to go through all the bips and bobs and then I'm going to jump inside and explain how this machine ticks. Of course, big thank you here also to the museum for allowing us to have access to uh, the Draken. They're currently renovating, which means that we're in a magnificent hangar full of exciting Cold War and pre-Cold War aircrafts. Some of these are really just found here in Sweden. So do make sure that if you come to Sweden to check out this museum as well. And of course, in your local neighborhood, there's also going to be an aviation museum. Support us as well with a visit because that's how this history stays alive. And of course, before I go now to talk about the Draken, big thank you to all the patrons and channel members as well for making this uh, sort of content possible. Now, first of all, on Draken, what we would have, of course, the Radom here with a pewter tube, but that has been demounted here on the uh, J variant. So we get a fantastic look here at the PS11A radar set. Now, Draken has different radar sets depending on the iteration, of course. This is more or less the last radar set that was used on this aircraft, and it operates, of course, in the X-band. And then you have this little bulbous fairing down low. What is that? Well, that is uh, the Hughes N71 ISTAR. So uh, infrared search and track, which allows you first to detect and then of course to track infrared objects or objects that give off an infrared signature, which is of course generally a heat signature. We then come towards the uh, cockpit, of course. We're going to jump inside that very, very soon. But of course, you'll find the avionics compartments dotted around this area of the aircraft with, of course, all the systems that Dragon requires to fly. And then behind me here, we've got the first engine intake for the engine. Uh, this is an RM6C, which is for all of you out there, you might already know this, but this is of course Rolls-Royce engine, Rolls-Royce Avon to be exact. It is a more powerful version of the engine than was produced in previous iterations of Draken, producing 12,500 pounds of thrust in the dry setting. And if you go that with that into afterburner, you hit it up to 1,750 pounds of force. And by the way, if you hear some droning noise outside, we are next to an active airbase, so you might hear a jet flying in and out or maybe a helicopter, but that's just the aviation vibe that we have here on Military Aviation History and it's awesome. Right, moving towards, of course, uh, or along the uh, leading edge, because this is already the wing. Yes, the engine intake is part of the wing. Draken is a double delta, which means you have a very aggressive sweep angle up front and then towards the, uh, well, sort of the last two thirds of the uh, wing, it branches off at a different angle where those two delta wings uh, are uh, superimposed on each other. However, that has been demounted, but we'll have a look at that in just a second, because then we, of course, come to the 30 millimeter Aiden gun, or as it is known in Sweden, the Akan M55. Now this fires a 30 by 111 millimeter cartridge, and it is a five chamber revolver gun and 100 rounds are installed on Draken for the pilot to use. Now, as you can see, this is where the muzzle would come here. The, the shots would come out straight there. And uh, initial versions of Draken had two of these guns, one on either side in the exact same position, whereas uh, on the F variant, one, namely the port side, was uh, taken away and instead you have just the remaining one here and that was of course carried over in the J variant as well. Moving then slightly forward towards that separation point in the two delta wings, which would be here, as you can see, it has been currently been dismounted, uh, demounted. Um, but if we were to draw a straight line now towards the wing route, maybe Josh, you can go over there, might be better to get a better look there. Uh, you will find the electrical generator that is of course attached to the engine, producing the electrical power that Draken needs. We also then have the fuel tanks of Drakens that are situated to my front here. There are two integral uh, tanks. Well, it's really one tank, but I believe uh, separated into a fore and aft compartment and an additional bladder tank there as well. And you have the exact same arrangement to my rear here towards the trailing edge of the wing as well. That is of course mirrored on either side, giving Draken a combined fuel load of 
roughly 6,500 pounds. Now, since the wing has been demounted, we can go straight ahead here, otherwise we would bump straight into that uh, delta wing. And we only find the inboard aileron here for, of course, uh, control of the aircraft. Looking up then, Draken is a tailless design. It's the first aircraft to have this sort of feature from all the main uh, fighter lineup that comes out of, of course, uh, Saab Aeronautics during the Cold War over then to the Vegan and later on to Gripen that is of course now in service and uh, has also been recently upgraded with Gripen E. Uh, what we have here of course is a pressure sensor up top for the uh, for the uh, flight control system. And if we look along the spine of the aircraft, you'll also see that intake scoop up front for the air conditioning system. Uh, you also see an air intake uh, ram and you have a VHF uh, and HF antenna there as well. We've got the air brake situated right here, relatively small for, uh, for an aircraft of this side. It's of course mounted on either side. And then we come towards the exhaust of the aircraft and up here, we have an absolute novelty, one might say, for a Saab aircraft because from, again, from all that lineup that we have with Saab, Draken, Vegan, Gripen, Draken is the last one to actually have a drag chute that is used on landing. Vegan doesn't have it. Vegan has thrust reverse, of course, used in order to shorten that, uh, that distance on the runway during the landing. And Gripen also, of course, has those large canards that deflect as air brakes as well. So it doesn't require a chute. And also a chute gets in the way of turnaround time, which is very important, of course, for the Swedish Air Force. So at the tail end of the aircraft, we also find a additional tail wheel that deploys. Now, as you can see, it is actually not situated on the ground when the aircraft is uh, on its tricycle landing gear, but this is simply there to prevent a tail strike on landing and on takeoff. Moving along then to the port wing. And in fact, at this point, we can take the trainer variant of the Draken and have a look here at the outboard uh, Delta uh, that is of course shaped at a slightly less aggressive angle than then on uh, the, uh, the leading edge there towards the front end of the aircraft. And uh, yeah, that, that gives you sort of an impression of how it would have looked like. Now, moving then towards our J variant once again. Also notice the Rolls-Royce Avon next to me. This is an earlier version. This is the B version and not the C, uh, but it gives you an impression of the general size of the engine, of course, that sits inside of Draken. Coming now to the main weapon systems that are used beyond the gun. You have two pylons on the wings, one on the outboard wing, which not featured here, and one over here. Now the outboard pylon was the original pylon and the inboard one was then mounted with the F variant and that was also carried over to J. These pylons mainly carried the RB24. Later on in Sweden, that would of course then be reclassified as the RB74 with the upgraded signed winders. That is of course an IR homing missile. This uh, missile would be used on either pylon and uh, would allow of course the aircraft to engage air-to-air -air targets with those uh, IR seekers and uh, engage in a dogfight there beyond the range of a gun. In Sweden, the designation system of these uh, missiles is quite interesting. RB stands for robot, that means missile, and the number stands for the type of missile it is, of course. And if it's an even number, that means it is an IR homing missile. If it's an uneven number, that means it's a radar homing. Now, I will duck now below this pylon because I want to talk a little bit about the gear. You can see that it swings to the outside and uh, of course incorporates a landing light as well. And then immediately next to it, we find one of the centerline pylon. There are two of them. You could of course mount a variety of weapons there, including air-to-air -air missiles or uh, bombs. And generally speaking, of course, in Draken, depending on the role that you're setting it up for, there are countless options there for air-to-air, air-to-ground, and uh, uh, of course also uh, additional fuel tanks. But these pylons, you generally see them being used for fuel tanks two of those adding roughly 2,000 pounds each. Then looking slightly ahead of us towards the nose wheel, find another antenna and uh, there's uh, of course the lower avionics compartments as well. There's some di distance measuring equipment that is set in here as well. And then of course we have the RAT, the RAM air turbine that is used in order to uh, re-power the electrical and the hydraulic system in case of an emergency. 
Let's walk towards the nose again in order to round up the walk around here. Because I'm of course going to jump inside of this one and we're going to take that camera with us and explore the inside of Draken and give you a full tour there. So as we do that, I of course celebrate one take and let's go inside the cockpit. Oh, this is tighter than expected. So I am in Draken and I'm gonna take you through all the instruments and all the levers and bips and bobs that you can find here in order to operate the aircraft. We're starting as always on the left hand side, working our way forward. Uh, got a very promising uh, light shield here for the radar scope of course. And then we're going to uh, go to the right hand side and finish it up there. So let's get started. As always, as we go through the cockpit, I will move from the left to the right. On the port side, we start with the emergency trim switch, the landing gear lever and the brake chute, the throttle with an integrated speed brake. Out of view here, but integrated on the forward right side of the throttle is the ground idle stop lock. And then we have the lighting control panel. To the bottom, we have a range measuring switch and then the IR and radar homing switch is on the top left. Right next to it on the top right is the radar mode selector. Then we have the antenna tuning adjustment wheel to the right and swinging to the side we have the frequency mode selector switch and finally the quick select switch for the Dragon's guns. And then we go forward from this to the starboard control panel, the forward starboard control panel. Here you will find the generator switches, the FR21 radio for VHF, AM and FM frequencies as well as FR28 radio set for the VHF and UHF. And then of course the secondary surveillance radar or SSR transponder switches are found here as well. The switches just above next to the canopy are from the rear, the external tank selectors, the landing and the taxi light switches. Let's now go towards the front instruments. Starting on the far left, we have the landing gear warning light, the backup altimeter, and the same for the speedometer. This is a backup. And then we have a manometer. Moving towards the front, let's start on the left hand side. Up top, an angle of attack meter, then a G accelerometer, the altimeter, and then the vertical indicator is your speedometer. The scale on the right is the integrated Mach counter. Such type of gauges are uncommon, but they do appear in various aircraft. For example, if you've seen the inside the cockpit video of the Buccaneer, you'll remember a very similar gauge, though it was mounted horizontally. The choice to use such an indicator was most likely made due to the available space in the cockpit. A tiny turn indicator sits just below this. Behind the control stick we find some additional instrument gauges and these are also some of the most important ones. The placement, truth be told, is not great, with the stick obscuring them from some angles. Honestly, on my whole trip in Sweden I was very impressed with Swedish cockpit layouts with this one appearing as a rare, but also a most obvious negative example. Starting on the top left, we have the heading indicator, followed by an attitude indicator and a dual indicator fuel gauge. Below that, direction indicator and an R engine RPM gauge. The engine exhaust temperature indicator is on the far right. Above all of this, you will find the radar scope. With its covering shroud, it looks like you see it here. And once taken off, it looks like this. Going forward to the top right of the instruments, we find a clock above a standby attitude indicator. The range and altitude indicator for the instrument landing system and the push buttons for the flight navigation system FLI-35. Then the heads up display with adjustment knobs to its right. Moving now to the right hand side, the first dials we see are the brake pressure set above the warning light panel. Then moving further down, the big panel is the radar control panel, followed by a control panel for the flight navigation system FLI-35. The steering wheel for the nose wheel, that's not something that you see every day to be honest. And outside of this, the switches for the system's test and store warnings. On the outside, we have a wide array of controls and switches. The large panel is your radar and weapons control panel. To the bottom right, we have the de-icer for the engine 
and the windscreen, and the air conditioning control is to its right. Above this, from the left, lighting controls and the emergency generator, and then the ignition switches are hiding to the bottom right. Below this, we find additional panels. From the front, the trim control panel, and then the oxygen flow indicator. And finally, we have the IFF control panel. Then, last but not least, the flight stick for pitch and roll control. Up top, the safety catch for the trigger, both for guns and missiles. Just next to it, the pitch trim switch. And on the other side, the quick autopilot release. The autopilot switch itself is set just above the press to transmit button for your radio on the left. And then with an obligatory knot at the rudder pedals for your control, of course, that rounds us up on the inside. So I hope that you enjoyed that. As always, big thank you to all the patrons and channel members for making Inside the Cockpit and the content on this channel possible. And of course, also the Swedish Air Force Museum for making this very access possible. It was an awesome experience sitting inside of here. I hope you uh, will also be going to many aviation museums around the world. Go to the ones that is nearest to you, support them. And of course, if you visit Sweden, come here to the Swedish Air Aviation Museum or the Swedish Air Force Museum rather. And, uh, enjoy this dragon and many other great aircraft that are completely unique to this country. So as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.